Welcome to the online uh, job vacancy workshop hosted by ESCO. Uh, I'm Kath Sleeman, I'm Head of Data Discovery at Nesta, and I'm going to be chairing this first session. The aim of today is to bring people together who use job adverts as data. Uh, we hope that the presentations give you some new ideas and potentially even spark uh, some new collaboration. So that we can fit everyone in and have some breaks in between, each presentation is going to just be 10 minutes and they'll run back to back. And then that should give us 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the hour uh, for some questions. Uh, each session will also be recorded and will be available uh, later. This first session is about standardizing advert data and then applying it to inform real world issues. So we have uh, two presentations about the biggest issue of the day, COVID. Uh, one from King's College with Berlin Glass data, and the second from Indeed's hiring lab. The third applied paper is from Tex Kernel, and it's about using adverts to measure the supply and demand uh, for skills. Uh, but we're starting with James Nee from Adzuna. He's going to be speaking about standardizing job adverts. But um, before I hand over to James, just to say, uh, please do submit your questions at any time uh, using the Q&A uh, function. Uh, just note at the start of the question who the question is for, uh, and then hopefully we can have a few questions ready to go uh, when we come to the end of the four presentations. So thanks again for joining, and uh, over to you, James. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Kath. Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Great. Okay, thanks very much for the intro. Um, and hello, everyone. I'm not sure quite how many people we've got uh, in the audience, but I understand it's it's quite large. So, um, yeah, I'll give you a, I'll kick things off with this sort of 10 minute, um, 10 minute dash through uh, online job vacancy data and specifically thinking about how standardizing that data can help add a lot more value to it. So if we could just flip onto the first slide, please, I'll give you a, a, a whirlwind uh, tour of Adzuna, just in case you haven't heard of Adzuna, very, very brief, uh, we a job search engine. Uh, we operate in the UK and 15 other countries. Um, so we, we've got a, an archive of job ads, which adds quite a lot of value when you're looking at doing the analysis. We go back over six years um, in the UK. Uh, tens of millions of, of users and job ads that, every month that we process um, and, and broadly what we're trying to do is, uh, is, is, a, is, is a very worthwhile mission which is to try and get people into, um, uh, into better and more fulfilling jobs. So just at the bottom we've got a, uh, sorry could you just flip back one slide I'm just going to mention just, just very briefly there's some, some of the organizations we share data with there um, and I'll just probably pick out one of them which is the ONS who I, who I know um, uh, are speaking later on, but we, we provide data for them to help them power their early um, uh, early indicators, metrics for job vacancies. So um, yeah, if you could flip to the next slide, this is really the, um, this is kind of my core message actually, which is that online job ads, hopefully everyone on this, on this workshop already knows this, but online job ads are an absolute gold mine of data. Um, so very briefly whizzing around these points, um, labor demand obviously job ads give you a fantastic insight into which country which companies are hiring um, what types of jobs they're looking for salaries and perks everyone knows that salaries are, are on job ads that's fine um, but perks is actually an interesting angle that not many people have looked at and that data tends to be buried in the job description which is something that i'll come on to a little bit later um, skills is also not explicit in job ads it's buried in the job description but um, what's nice about job ads is that if you've got enough of them, the skills that people are asking for, you can aggregate that up and then you can, you can effectively assume that that gives you, a, 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 in aggregate, a really nice profile of these are the skills that are associated with this particular job. And again, I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, in a bit, bit later. Uh, industry sector growth, obviously with enough job ads, you can classify them into industries and see which sectors are doing well, which ones aren't. Uh, regional segmentation is self-explanatory. Company indicators is, is an interesting one. Uh, if, you know, if you know which companies are hiring, there's all sorts of things that you can do with that. Um, and there's definitely a branch of investment companies, hedge funds who are interested in 
doing really sophisticated stuff. So looking at, for example, if certain companies, maybe they're listed public companies, if they're hiring um, in a certain area um, at a certain rate, maybe they might take that as, a, as like a buying signal. So they say, okay, this, this company is going places, we should, we should invest. Um, so that's another factor. And then change of working patterns is around, um, I mean, it's very relevant in, in the COVID context. We've recently launched on Adzuna a remote working tab, um, uh, which you can use to um, yeah, filter for whether jobs are remote working or not. But of course, there's a lot more subtlety to it than that. It's, um, I know lots of companies are now looking at uh, allowing uh, partial remote working. So, you know, this job, you know, is in the office three days a week, but working from home two days a week, for example. So this, you could, it's a whole load of insight we can get there. And of course, the wonderful thing about job ads is, um, especially online job ads, is the timeliness. So not only have we got the history, which is great, but actually the timeliness, you know, we update data feeds from, from companies multiple times per day. Um, and then having got all that, you know, timely data, then you can slice and dice it by yeah, like location, industry title, as you wish. So there's a lot there. So hopefully that message of online job ads or a gold mine, everyone's hopefully kind of nodding, thinking, yeah, we, we know there's a lot of value there. However, look to the next slide, please. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of caveats here. Um, they are also also a nightmare, you, you might say. Maybe I'm, um, I'm dramatizing that a little bit. Um, but it's basically messy data. It gets free, a lot of it's free tech, it's messy data. Um, I don't know if you can read this okay on the, on the slide, but um, the, the two on the left are just fun live. I think these examples I pulled off just a few days ago from Azuna, where the job title is just, you know, I guess as a human, you can make sense of it, but it's pretty messy from a sort of data perspective. It's pretty messy. Um, I don't really even know what that, what that first one's all about. Um, and then on the right, where it's, it's a consultant petroleum chemist, um, there's a couple of, of quirks there, which are unfortunately not that unusual. So we've got clearly some kind of typo or what have you in the salary up to a pound a year. Very generous. Um, and then if you can read it, the, the location is also quite fun. You know, England, City of London. You think, okay, London. And then Cardiff. And, and they've even put Cardiff in, in Welsh there, I think. So... Um, you, you get the idea, it's this kind of mess of data. And actually, there's one more example, if you could just flip to the, the next slide, please. Um, just an example of, you know, it, even the descriptions, where you think descriptions should be fairly sort of reliably informative. Um, this is just an example. There's nothing really wrong with this description, by the way. It's just um, it's one that I found on the Find a Job website, which, which, which actually adds Zuna powers. The, we, we actually run the, the Find a Job website, so that's why I was looking at it. And it just struck me as entertaining that somebody should should give such a brief summary for a, for a job. But I suppose with certain jobs, you don't need a huge amount of detail. But um, these are the kinds of examples of where, um, uh, yeah, the data is, shall we say, challenging. So um, on the next slide, um, I've just shown, so sorry, there's quite a lot on here, but um, it's worth just briefly talking through some of this. What we've got on the left is an... Is, is the core data fields that you would typically find. So when, so our Zoom as an aggregator, we get, we do scraping of job ads, we get data, XML data feeds from job boards, we get it in, and generally you get these fields. So you get title, description, location, salary, company, category, maybe, and, and contract type and contract type. Those are sort of the standard fields. And there's examples from, from a real ad, there's an example, example text there. Um, and then the, the key characteristic of all of these all of these data fields in this example is that they're basically free tech, except for one. I think contract type and contract time is probably the most standardized, um, probably the least useful as well, but all the others are free text. And free text is kind of brilliant, but leads to all these problems of, um, uh, of, of messy data and things just not lining up. So, so really that's almost like a core message of, 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 of this, first talk really is to say that with, with a bit of work, a bit of data science, not a huge amount, but a bit of work, a lot of processing, because there's lots of ads, you can basically tidy these up and standardize them. Um, so if we look at that title, we can standardize that to bar person. And to do that, you need a bit of tech. You need to be able to strip out the stuff that's not relevant. You need an ontology. So effectively a list of, of standardized job titles. And maybe you have some synonyms there. Um, so you need to standardize it. Um, 
But then the nice thing is you can actually do stuff with that. And in, in a moment, I'll, I'll explain a bit more about what you can do with it. But um, similar logic applies to the skill. So if you take, take the description, uh, there's only one, this is only one piece that we're pulling out of the description, but just pulling out the list of skills is a useful way of standardizing that data. The location is free text. You need some kind of a location tree or structure to be able to standardize that. Um, salaries, yeah, you might think that's really straightforward. It's not that complex, I suppose, but there's, you know, salaries can come in any currency. Um, they could be phrased as uh, hourly, weekly, monthly, what have you, annual. Um, so there is some cleaning up and standardizing, and you only have a range there. You, you may have a range, you may not have a range. So you can see some of the, the nuances here. Um, company titles are a bit like the job title. They're a little bit more straightforward. Um, except you'd be surprised at how, how many different ways company names can be written. So there's lots of challenges there. And with categories, they are kind of semi-standardized, which is nice, but we actually use a, a machine learning model to read the description and, and the title of, of the job ads and then assign it into a category. Um, we found that was actually the most accurate way of doing it. So, so those are those are the, the common fields, and, and 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 the message here is, you know, it's 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 possible. It's not straightforward, but with a bit of work, you can standardize this stuff, and that adds a lot of value. So, if you just flip to the next slide, just some some examples of what you can do here. I mean, like the list is kind of endless, but um, it might be a bit too small to read. I don't, I don't know. But on the left, it's just simply a chart. I think the example here is for an accountant in the southwest of England. Um, you might have um, you know, changes in vacancy counts and salaries over time. To do that accurately, you need to have those standardized titles. Otherwise, you wouldn't be including all the different ways that accountants could be written. Um, and once you've got that data, you can, you can do all the other good stuff. So map it out, use the geospatial analysis, go to your heart's content. The nice thing about job ads, they're quite, um, you get quite good granular location data. And on the right, it's an example of what I mentioned earlier. If you take, for example, all the tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands of accountant jobs that have appeared online over time, you can pull out all their skills and you can create kind of aggregated pro skills profiles, which you can then do very useful stuff with later on. So that really is the core of it. And I'm conscious in this presentation that we've got people, I think, listening will be at very different levels of of sophistication here. So I imagine for lots of people, they'll be familiar with the core data fields. Hopefully the, this explanation about standardization has been useful. I just want to finish with a couple of slides. If you flick to the next one, we'll, we'll take it to the next level. Sorry for the meme, but I, I can't do a presentation without including at least one or two memes in it. Um, and I just want to talk about um, just, just like a few more sophisticated things that you can start to do. Um, so if we flip to the penultimate slide, I just want to talk about the job descriptions, basically, because this is what I'd really call it, sort of the secret value of job ads um, that people okay, people know about it, but it's actually it's secret because it's actually quite hard to tap into it. So with my sort of very basic iceberg analogy, the title, location, salary, all those fields I was just talking about, they're sort of the tip of the iceberg. Um, but actually descriptions, they, these descriptions, well, we've all read job descriptions, you know, they could be 100, 200, 300 words. There's a lot there. Um, and it's just hard to get at it because it's free text. So I've just listed out here three you know, three options that are just worth maybe highlighting for people just to think about. It might, might trigger some thoughts, might get people excited about it. Um, so the first one, just text parsing. So this could be natural language processing or it could be sort of regular expressions, that kind of stuff. But with a bit of work, you can start to infer things about seniority level company details, because there's often a section in, in job ads talking about, about the company. So you, you could sort of start to build profiles of companies, um, educational requirements. Perks is an interesting one, of course. In job ads, they, you, know, you could definitely have a, a piece of work researching how um, companies like to add more and more perks, like you know, uh, gym membership, uh, private health, et cetera. So there's a load of good stuff there. Um, the second one is linguistic analysis. So now we're starting to move much more into like the machine learning world. So hopefully a lot of people are still with me on this, but um, if, you, if you or your company doesn't have the tech to do this, by the way, there's a whole load of open source APIs where you can just pump in the text and it will come back with um, sentiment analysis. So you could kind of 
again, investment companies might be interested in understanding whether there's like a positive or negative tone to, to, to job ads for a particular company. Gender bias, a massive, you know, diversity and inclusion is, is just a massive topic right now. So you could pull that out of, of job ads and a bunch of stuff about the culture. And then the last one I'll mention, um, again, very briefly, we don't have time, of course, to go into any details, it's vector embedding. So apologies, I, I won't explain what these are particularly in the, now because we don't have time, but in essence, they're a way of using the corpus of job descriptions to, to represent titles and skills um, or anything else actually as a series of numbers. And once you represent them as a series of numbers, you can start to do all kinds of cool stuff like clustering. And actually this is kind of what we do at Zoom sort of clustering. This is, this is how we, this is kind of why we don't have a structure or a hierarchy to our ontology. We could just use um, similarity metrics from, um, from vector embeddings and you can do sort of discovery of skills and recommendations. Uh, and if you're interested, that little chart on the right is some real data that we produced. It's, it's what they call a T-SNE plot, which is a way of collapsing all this data into two dimensions and, and it's actually just showing how really nicely how I think we've got developer jobs in green and teaching jobs in purple, how they cluster. So they, they really do cluster. So that's enough for now. If we flip to my last slide, I'll just wrap up in conclusion. I, I know we're on a bit of a, a timeline here. Um, so yeah, job ads are a gold mine. Hopefully I've convinced you of that. They're also a nightmare um, due to the unstructured text. Um, we can solve that by standardizing, standardizing the data. Um, it's possible to do it, but I would say as my kind of other, other take home message here, job descriptions, there's a huge amount of untapped data in there. So and it's all there, all there to be explored. So um, yeah, thank you very much. I hope that can generate some questions for later on and I'll, I'll hand you back to Kath at this stage. It's brilliant. Thanks so much, James. Um, it's a great introduction. Um, we'll head straight on to, we've got Elodie Andrew from uh, King's College using burning glass data. Hello, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, so first I wanted to thank the organizers for the initiative of bringing all the, all the researchers using job vacancy data together, because I think it's going to be a very interesting day. So what I'm going to present today is very just, very initial work so it's really ongoing work so your comments are more than welcome so we're going to look at how well were companies prepared for covid merging job vacancy company accounts and web scrape data so this work is joined with leila o'kane from burning glass and also mario maroney and alexi romanko from from king's college london which will also be probably connected to help me with the questions if you have any so the motivation of this work is very much the same motivation of the um, of the workshop today because we believe that burning glass has found job vacancy in general have as james pointed a gold mine of information and very timely so if we go to the next slide please so um, our work is in the context of covid19 so as you all probably know and are aware of we had um, faced the covid since the beginning of the year and the uk government have set up some lo different lockdowns so first in march and then one that uh, finished just actually a couple of weeks ago. And the government during this lockdown have forced companies to either shut or remain open only if they were essential. So um, what we want to actually look is that companies which were in the non-essential sector had kind of two decisions to make. Either they were just closed until further notice until the business could uh, go back to normal or they could adapt and then shift maybe their workforce for um, to work from home or to adapt the business. So we could say, for example, a restaurant to, that was only used to do dining in could maybe adapt and do some delivery service. So here we contribute to the literature. So the literature around COVID has been continuously growing. So around many different topics, but here we will particularly concentrate and contribute to the literature around how the financial situation of firms have actually helped companies to be resilient or not. So I've listed here three different papers. So one by Bouchard et Al, uh, looking at a German survey and saying that weak firms before the crisis were actually less uh, able to resist during the crisis. Similarly, Song and Al focus on the restaurant um, sector in the US and also they find that all the finance, like a more strong, finan a better financial situation before the crisis helped firms to remain active and stay on the market. And similarly, fi similar findings for, for Chinese companies by Xiong et al. So of course this list is non-exhaustive, but here I'm naming a few. 
what we so we believe that the financial situation is completely um, a channel to help firms to resist to the crisis but what we want to add on that is that we want to say that was pos potentially a technological readiness of firms pre-crisis that enabled firms also to resist to this crisis to be more resilient so we don't want to say that the financial situation was not a factor but we want to add on that and maybe try to look at what share was more important was it just the money situation or was it more the technological readiness so what we do in this paper is that we create a large firm level database and in this database we sorry we will have a measure of resilience a measure of cloud usage of companies labor hiring and the skills and the financial situation so if we go to the next slide and i will um, explain to you what are the different databases we are merging so first we need data at the firm level so in that case we're going to use the burning glass technologies uh, data so on the, using this, uh, this data, we will have information on the labor hiring activities of firms, and we are, we are able to have occupation and industry level information from the ad, and the skills required. Um, then we will use FAME, lab, FAME database, which will uh, enable, us, uh, enable us to have all the financial characteristics of the firm, in addition to also employees and profits and et cetera. Then we're going to use the cloud computing measure. So this measure was computed by uh, Olexki. So he has scraped uh, um, online, online data to be able to understand if the company was actually using, is actually using currently some cloud technologies or not. And then Olexki also um, computed since the beginning, uh, scraped since the beginning of the crisis, since March, a resilience measure. So he has scraped online um, websites. So there's a, this whole literature stating that uh, companies are very active online and even more and more active online. So we believe that the firms, firms have uh, firms timely update the information on their website. So using, using the text of the website of the company, Olexki was able to create the, a measure of if the firm was closing, staying open or adapting. Then we need, so this is all for the firm level databases, but then we need uh, data for the, to follow the crisis. So this could be cases, devs, and we can think of others. And then we will include industry level data because we have to separate probably the essential VS non-essential sectors because they are hit differently. So if we go to the next slide, I will uh, give you very just descriptive, uh, very initial descriptive that we've done. So on the left hand side, you have the number. So you have the resilience measure that Oleski has computed. So what you can see is that, so we haven't really looked into all the, vari the small variations that you see on the graph, but quickly the blue line, if you see has, uh, is the number of innovators. So what we consider as innovators are the companies that have adapted to the crisis. So they, for, for example, they said like, we remain open, but deliver only or, so they have signaled that they are changing their activity. And we see that the number of innovators, the number of firms innovating is increasing over time. And then we see a shift around August that is going down. So we don't have any explanation for that yet, but these are the kind of, of, um, of analysis that we want to look at from what is going on. Then on your right hand side, we have, this is our first match of fame and uh, burning glass technologies. Um, so here we plot the change in number of ads since the, the, the beginning of the crisis relative to 2019 period. So you, we can see that actually the, the small firms seem to have increased on average the number of ads, whereas the very large firms have decreased this number of ads. What I'm not showing, showing here, but what I, we also uh, looked into is that maybe these small firms are actually more exiting the market. So the remaining firms are maybe just the more, most productive ones. So these are also some kind of uh, questions we are going to ask ourselves. So we cannot really conclude anything from these descriptives, but this was to show you a bit what kind of uh, data we had. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So our main, like the whole study is based on what we mean by technological readiness. So we need to define it in a way that we can convey people that uh, it is very, it's important and um, that you also believe that it helps the company to adapt. So to do that, we consider a couple of dimensions. So first we will use burning glass technologies and the skills and IT, 
the skills and occupation details. So we believe there are some specific skills that enable the firm to adapt and to uh, go digital. And we also, we, so the skills might be the more disaggregate level, but we will also look at the occupation level and just consider some specific IT workers that have enabled the digitalization of the firm. Uh, we will also add uh, the measure of cloud computing. So we believe that it's a proxy for the digital integration of the firm. And I guess I don't have to, to convince you, but uh, cloud computing, a firm using cloud computing is definitely a, a company using a lot of data and probably going online. And what is most importantly is that we are going to use, we are going to create this measure at the industry level. So this is motivated by the fact that, for example, an a service industry, uh, a restaurant, for example, will not need as much as digitalization than a um, manufacturer that needs to automate a production process. So in that sense, we're going to try to look at the technological complexity, maybe. So this is still ongoing work. So we are not exactly sure how we're going to do this industry level, but we are considering and we will take this into account. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So um, yes, this is my final slide. So as I told you, it's very initial work. So we have a lot on the agenda. So first we want to refine our matching at the employer level. So um, this is because uh, it's uh, text data and fame and burning less both have employer name and the direct matching of course is not working. So we need to we need to refine this matching to cover more and more firms. We want to construct our digital readiness indicators. We have, so we have quite a lot of uh, ideas how we're gonna do that, but we need, to, we need to finalize it and construct it. Then we want to refine our representativeness of our final database. So we know that the OECD is working hard on that, but we will have to adjust a bit because the final database will be slightly different to the entire burning glass database. Um, and then we will think of including other controls, uh, for example, the government schemes, because as I said, the government schemes uh, having, uh, have um, pushed more, for some sectors to close and some not, and also the follow, follow scheme. So we want to consider this. And just, I haven't mentioned, um, we, our aim is to cover more or less 500,000 um, firms, for UK firms. So we believe that it's uh, quite representative of the UK uh, industry found labor market. So thank you. Uh, next slide, I think it's just thank you. And yeah, we're looking forward for your comments. It's brilliant. Thank, thank you, you so much, much Elodie. Uh, it's a great illustration of the kind of potential of job adverts when they're kind of combined with other data sets, I think. So um, that's brilliant. And then next up, we've got uh, Pavel from Indeed Hiring Lab. Um, and please do uh, continue to submit questions as, the, as they occur to you. But yeah, over to you, Pavel. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kath, and good morning, everyone. Um, I see a lot of familiar names here in the audience, uh, but for those uh, I haven't met yet, my name is Pavel Adrian, and I'm an economist at the Indeed Hiring Lab in London. Um, in today's presentation, I will try to do two things. First, I will show you how the quantity and the mix of job vacancies is changing in the second wave of the coronavirus as measured by job postings on Indeed. And second, I will combine the data on job postings with data on clicks that those postings receive from job seekers to show how job search is adjusting to these changes and what that could mean for labor market tightness in different occupations, which is something that I think is very relevant uh, to job seekers, to employers, and also to trends in pay. Um, and throughout all this, uh, I will highlight some of the main variables uh, that we're currently tracking in the Indeed data as we try to track the labor market recovery uh, this year and going into next year. So on the next slide, um, for, uh, just to set the context, the trend in the quantity of job postings that we're currently seeing on Indeed uh, certainly suggests that the recovery remains quite slow. We measure the uh, trends in job postings as the gap between the 2020 trend, which you can see in yellow, and the 2019 trend, which you can see in orange, uh, both indexed to 100 on the 1st of February. 
And this is a way to capture a seasonal adjustment in a way that we can easily represent visually. What you can see from this chart is that in the past uh, years, um, November job postings tended to fall uh, because hiring usually slowed towards the end of the year. And this year, uh, job postings in November uh, were stable, uh, which helped narrow the gap um, a little bit uh, compared to last year's trend. Uh, but the fact that we aren't really seeing an increase right now um, as we grapple uh, with the second wave of the virus uh, is still a concern uh, given how big that gap uh, still is. So this is kind of the context uh, and the most fundamental piece of data that we can track uh, in job vacancies, which is uh, the total uh, volume of job postings. Uh, but as James um, and LOD alluded to in their presentations, there is lots more uh, that we can track. And one thing um, that we track within this big set of uh, job postings data are the individual job titles and occupations. And what's really important to keep in mind is that the overall trend um, and this overall gap that we're seeing in the data um, really varies a lot by occupation because some jobs uh, are performing a lot better than others. And you can see that on the next slide. Uh, this chart shows the weekly inflow of new job postings on Indeed in four selected occupations. Um, the two worst performing ones, uh, which are food preparation and service in blue and hospitality and tourism in orange, um, where hiring um, started to pick up when the economy opened up over the summer, but has really fallen back quite significantly since then. And uh, we also see uh, two among the best performing occupations, which are loading and stocking and driving, both important, uh, both important occupations within e-commerce um, and online shopping and delivery, uh, which have actually uh, recovered or almost recovered uh, compared to last year's trend. What this divergence uh, of trends across sectors means is that the current mix of job postings um, has changed a lot compared to, the, to before the pandemic. So we're not really just talking about a change in the quantity of uh, job vacancies, but also um, about a big change in the mix uh, of vacancies that are available. Uh, next slide, please. And one way to measure that change in the vacancy mix is to look at the distribution of job postings across the 6,000 or so standardized job titles that we use at Indeed and see how it differs uh, today compared to the same time last year. And what we find is that 19% of currently advertised uh, job titles uh, in November would need to change for the overall mix of vacancies or the mix of job postings to be the same as it was a year ago. So in other words, almost one fifth of postings have shifted towards different job titles. And that's actually quite substantial because it's a bigger shift uh, that we've seen in a year than the shift that we had seen in the previous three years in the labor market. So a big change uh, in the quantity and the mix. Now, why is this important? Well, a change in the mix of job postings uh, is something that we do expect to see over time. And it wouldn't necessarily be a problem uh, for matching in the labor market if there were more vacancies uh, to begin with, and if workers were able to adjust uh, to these shifts in demand for new workers. Um, but uh, on the next slide, uh, we see uh, some anecdotal evidence that we've been actually seeing a lot of in press headlines recently, uh, suggesting that that's not really the case, um, that job seekers are following uh, the demand shifts. Um, with some jobs actually being overwhelmed uh, with applicants, uh, especially in sectors like hospitality that really aren't hiring a lot of new workers. But one thing that we can do uh, using the potential of uh, online data is to actually go beyond uh, this type of anecdote and combine the data on job postings uh, with data on clicks uh, that those postings receive from job seekers as a way to measure tightness in the online job market and how that tightness uh, is shifting in different occupations. 
at Indeed, we get around 50 million uh, visits in the UK each month. So um, that's actually a really good idea of, um, that gives us a really good idea of job search activity uh, that's happening on the platform that we can use to get a sense of that tightness. So on the next slide, um, when we look at the shifts in clicks per job postings in November of 2020, compared to a year ago, we find that those shifts um, have actually been highly uneven. The largest increases are in areas like food preparation and service, where posting volume has shrunk a lot. And we see similar things happening in human resources, customer service, administrative and retail jobs, which are all suffering uh, to a similar degree. But on the other hand, in areas where there is very strong demand for new workers, like loading and stocking or uh, medical technician jobs, clicks per posting have actually fallen uh, compared to a year ago because demand has really outpaced supply uh, that we see on the job search side. So job seekers uh, for the time being are actually retaining a fairly healthy interest in sectors that are lagging uh, in the recovery. Do these trends uh, matter? Um, next slide, please. Uh, they do matter for job seekers, uh, first and foremost, because the balance of supply and demand really affects competition for jobs in different occupations. They matter for employers, because some are likely to see huge application volumes um, and much higher application volumes than others, while some will actually continue to struggle to fill certain uh, roles despite uh, the crisis and despite the potential for unemployment to rise. Uh, those are jobs, for instance, in nursing uh, or uh, technology and software. And what's really important to see is also that these shifts in the online jobs market are likely to matter for wages too. Um, last year, in a paper with my co-author Ray Leiden at the Central Bank of Ireland, we found that changes in clicks per job posting actually helped explain wage trends um, at the occupational level over and beyond other measures of tightness. So the excess supply of job seekers in sectors where hiring is weak, which we're currently seeing to some extent, could impact pay trends going forward. And on the next slide, um, I'd like to show you that we are beginning to see some possible signs of that in the job posting data, where for example, medical technicians where we've seen a decline in clicks uh, per job posting are the occupation with the biggest year-on-year -year increase in average pay of 12%. Whereas food preparation and service is an example of an occupation where we've seen a big increase in clicks per job posting, so a big increase in job seeker interest relative to demand for new workers. And that is also one of the occupations with the biggest falls in average advertised pay, a decline of 7% um, year on year, which is pretty substantial. So uh, just uh, the final slide. Then to conclude, um, I want to highlight the three numbers uh, from this presentation that reflect the current state of the UK labour market in the second wave and show the types of information that we are tracking in online data at Indeed. Number one, job postings, 41% below last year's trend. Number two, 19% of job titles are different than a year ago on a standardized basis, which shows a huge shift in the mix of postings. And number three, a 7% drop in average advertised pay in food preparation and service an occupation where hiring remains low. And this trend in posted wages, uh, both in this occupation and across uh, the board, across the occupations that we're seeing on Indeed, is something that we will be watching very closely in 2021. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Pebble. It just shows like, uh... I guess the potential of job adverts to act as a kind of a really important indicator for the health of the economy, doesn't it? Um, so that's great. And then next up, we've got uh, Grant and Belka from Tex Kernel. 
Good morning, everybody. My name is Grant Telfer. I'm responsible for sales for Texco in the UK. Uh, I've got Bauke with me, who is one of our senior technical consultants. Uh, we're going to focus in this short, uh, short presentation specifically on skills. We think this is an important part in terms of the data that's out there. It's just how do you get that and extract it? Why is it important? Well, we think it's important in terms of mobility. That's mobility within companies, between companies, and also we're going to see more and more, I think, mobility in terms of migration to different roles and different careers. Next slide, please. Many of you may be familiar with Text Kernel, but for those of you that aren't, uh, we've been operating for around 20 years. Our key premise is matching people to the right jobs as quickly and effectively as possible. And when we started out, we started out with document parsing and we refined this to CV parsing and very quickly focused on the recruiting market. And uh, our key aim there was to actually build on that. So we built powerful semantic search and then we extend that further in terms of helping people understand the job market and get data insights from it. Next slide, please. Now, many of you might have a similar diagram or seen a similar iteration. This is about, I guess, the life cycle of an employee. So understanding the skills that are required within organizations and posting those skills out there in terms of online job ads is extremely important. And that's going to be very important in terms of attracting the right candidates and matching the skills against the post. But it doesn't end there. I mean, the life cycle will actually continue within organizations as they look at aspects like workforce planning, what training is required, how do we actually ret retain our employees longer uh, through internal roles. And that's really important in terms of succession planning. But what we wanted to do today was just show you a unique way in which we've we, we've put together a, a method to actually view skills. And I'm gonna hand over to Bauke to do that. Yeah, thank you, Grant. Um, so my name is Bauke Fischer. I'm a consultant at Text Kernel. Can I sh uh, show the next slide, please? So um, our vacancy data uh, uh, is, is uh, in, inside a product called JobFeed. And uh, we, we spider the web in 10 countries. Uh, we uh, spider for uh, vacancy postings um, in uh, eight European countries and two uh, Northern American com uh, country countries. And we um, extract roughly uh, 70 fields out of each uh, posting. On the left-hand side, you see some of the fields that we uh, uh, extract from that data. And uh, we normalize those fields also so uh, into, uh, into uh, standardized fields like uh, uh, standardized professions, standardized uh, contract types, locations, um, uh, um, uh, education level, that kind of thing. And we give our customers um, access to this data. On the bottom of the list, you see the skills that we extract. So we, we, we uh, invested heavily in uh, extracting skills from vacancies and also normalizing these skills. Um, and uh, we uh, currently recognize roughly around 11,000 unique skills from job uh, advertisements. Uh, every job, uh, every advertisement has roughly between eight, uh, between five and 20 skills mentioned in the in in the in the vacancy. And we also give this uh, this data. We give our customers access access to this skill data nowadays. Um, and now I want, would want to share my screen. Let's see how that works. Ah, yes. Thank you. So. Um, so you should be able to uh, see my screen now so what i wanted to show is our skill explorer so uh, one of the one of the challenges when you when you uh, when you start uh, extracting all the skill data is how to categorize those skills so 11000 skills we extract and uh, what we decided to do is let the data uh, um, uh, 
tell us how to categorize those skills. Um, so what we did was calculate how skills are related to each other uh, based on co-occurrence of skills in vacancies and then project that in a 3D space. And that this, what you're seeing here, the cloud that you're seeing here is the result of that. So every dot represents a skill. The closer the dots are together, the closer the relatedness between the skills and the red dots are the dots that are mentioned um, uh, uh, most often in the corpus and the blue ones are mentioned le less often in the corpus. And what strikes straight away is that you see those strands appear on the edge of the, of the cloud. Uh, and when I zoom in, you will see which, which are the skills that are in one of these strands. So what, I, what I'm showing you here is the dentistry strand. Um, so these skills uh, often to get, uh, occur together in, uh, in, in vacancies, but they don't uh, occur together with other skills. So that's why they result in such a, a isolated strand. So at the top of the strand, the more uh, generic, the more uh, skills that are often occurring. And at the, at the, at the bottom of the strand, the more sp specialized uh, skills uh, in dentistry here. So this is already a way uh, or a first step into categorizing skills. Let me show you one more. Let's do, for instance, welding. So this is the welding skill. And you can see already here also a little bit of a, of a strand uh, appearing. Um, and what you could see if I go down the strand is uh, a lot of skills in the, in the area of um, um, metal uh, processing. And how the, the, more, the, the deeper I go, the more uh, specialized the skills are. Some um, more technical, more, more uh, IT uh, and automated uh, automation related skills. Uh, it, it becomes more um, electrotechnical as well. Let's do one more NLP, natural language processing. Uh, one of the skills that are, is very near to my heart because that is what is applied when you process these, these textual data. Um, yeah, so, some, some uh, statistics, um, uh, statistical uh, techniques mentioned here, uh, some programming languages, some uh, NLTK and H2O are Python libraries that are used for uh, natural uh, language processing. Um, and here it's, it's going more into, uh, into the direction of uh, statistics. Um, and now, so, so why am I showing you this? So the, the, the Skill Explorer is not, uh, not really a product that we sell to customers. It's more um, an inspiration that I want to show you for what, what, what one can do with all this data. So uh, skills don't only have uh, a relationship to, uh, with each other, but also a relationship with education levels, with um, professions. The skills have a relationship even with, with locations. And one of the um, uh, applications that's, that, is, that one can think of is if I have a candidate who wants to make a, 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 a career transition, and I know his skills and I know the, the profession that he wants to go to, I can use this data to calculate what the next skills are that he needs to develop in order to have a good ch chance of landing uh, this, this job in this profession that he wants to, uh, that, that he wants to pursue, pursue his career in. Um, yeah, this is more or less all I wanted to show you. Uh, I think uh, back to Grant uh, for now. Thanks for your attention. Grant. Hi, if you could just put the slides back on, please. Thank you very much. So yes, as Bauke said, that's, I guess, something that we built. We all know, as James said in his initial presentation, there's a gold mine of data out there, and that's been clear in terms of everybody that's been speaking this morning. But it's how do you access that? How do you build the relationships? Who is it useful to? So yes, it's, in, it's a great use to individual companies, to, uh, to, to um, staffing and employment agencies. Yes, it's obviously really important to, I guess, the country and, and governmental level. There's all sorts of applications of this. And 
that understanding of skills has different contexts. And one of the ones that I think is becoming more obvious and that we know about is whilst technology is great, whilst automation is fantastic, whilst we can do more and new jobs are appearing, we also should be conscious that it is going to impact specific roles. And there are more manual roles that are already being affected. Uh, ironically, maybe being a warehouse assistant right now, particularly with all the deliveries that have been going on this year, is uh, perhaps a more protected job than it was. But this slide should be viewed vertically. It's all about, well, what are some other categories that a warehouse assistant might do? Because they already have skills. What can they transfer? What additional skills do they need to learn? And that might be becoming a driver. It might be becoming a logistics assistant. And in the same way for a booking agent, how could they become, say, a head of reception or even a little bit more of a broad move to account manager telesales? So that's what we wanted to show today in terms of skills. Uh, thank you very much for listening and we will see you in the Q&A. Brilliant, thanks so much Grant and Belka. Um, fantastic data visualization, oh, very, very nice. So um, I think we've just seen through that range of presentations all completely different, but all hi highlighting very kind of different use cases for, um, you know, for the potential of job adverts um, as a data set. So if we uh, dive now straight into the Q&A, we've already had a couple of questions come in. So why don't we start with uh, Alexei Romanko. You had a couple of questions, one for James and one for Pavel. Um, hopefully, Sarah, can you unmute Alexei so we can- Hi, Cass. Thank you so much for uh, giving me the voice. Uh, so my first question is uh, addressed to James New. Uh, so thank you so much, James, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is next one. How do you think the future of online job platforms would look like? Is there any chance that Azuna and UK job platforms would work under standardization of fields, for example, providing a user titles as a dictionary instead of free form entry, or for example, providing allocation field as a map instead of free form as well? As in order to drive a better user experience for for job platform customers and higher data usability for other data users such as NS. Yeah, you, brilliant question, Lex. So, so short answer is long term. Yes, I, I do see that happening long term, but it's going to take a while. Um, I, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but it really. It would be the, the dream would be if we had a single standardized in fact it would probably need to be a global standardized ontology of job titles and skills for this to work um we don't have that now there's lots of competing ontologies out there which i won't, I won't talk, talk about um but uh the, the short answer is I, I do i do see that happening in the long term i totally agree with you the value would be there um at Zuna, i can say would be very willing to participate in that and, and switch if there was a suitable ontology but I think the, the bottom line is it would require something like that. Is it's a big initiative that you're that you're suggesting here. It would require some kind of some kind of body, whether it's governmental or some other department, uh, to to coordinate it and, and, to, and to provide that initiative. It needs you know you can see the commercial issues. If one company says, oh, you know, we we think we've got the best ontology, everyone should use this, that would be a challenge. So um, yeah, hopefully that that kind of answers your question as best as I can. Right, and then there was also a question, Alexi, that you had for uh, Pavel. Yep, okay. Uh, so my question to Pavel uh, uh, was uh, whether indeed, do, do you think whether indeed can do anything to help balance, you know, this, this demand supply spikes during crisis situation? Uh, I don't know, for example, just uh, show some trends for food preparation specialists saying, guys, you you'd probably have the lowest probability on the market to find your next job. So why, why don't you search within jobs from other similar industry or provide some suggestions for jobs they, they might pursue or provide some time estimation saying, okay, probably in two months you'll get more jobs than now. Uh, yeah, that's a great uh, question, um, Alexi. I think there's more that both job sites and policymakers can do uh, to get this to happen. So on the job site side, 
um, you know, at Indeed, we do publish uh, research uh, on these trends. Uh, we publish it on our blog. Um, the media cover it. So that's one way for job seekers to get that information. Um, and also from a product perspective, um, there are product uh, aspects of uh, job sites that help suggest certain types of jobs to certain job seekers based on uh, the availability of those jobs and the interests and the skills of job seekers. Uh, but I think in the long term, the dream situation would be also for uh, local and uh, national governments to use that kind of real time data as they help people get uh, jobs directly on the ground as well. So perhaps uh, careers advisors in schools and at job centers um, using this information to, to direct people uh, to certain areas. Um, and certainly uh, Kath can speak to this because Nesta have been doing a lot of uh, work on the potential to getting for getting these data to job seekers and mapping uh, possible transitions that could be tapped into at times of crises like this one. Brilliant. Thanks for those answers. So next up, we've got a question from Ria Leiden from the Central Bank of Ireland. And that's a question for uh, Elodie. Do you want to go ahead with your question, Ria? Yeah. Hi, Elodie. Um, I really like uh, the question you're asking about tech readiness. I think it's a really interesting aspect of this crisis. I know you're thinking about the labor market, financial regulators and in financial stability, tech readiness is a big issue as well. And you, you'll see that financial regulators have been grilling the firms they regulate about their tech readiness. So it's not just in the labor market where this is an issue, but also in, in financial regulation, which I think is interesting. Um, my question is about um, furlough schemes. And I know it's early days for the work and you mentioned furlough schemes, but have you got any more thoughts about how furlough schemes affect the dynamics of, of vacancy posting because it, it's basically labor hoarding and um, but you've also got a, an expected demand shock going on there as well and how do you disentangle the two I, i've been doing some work with um indeed open data looking at vacancy posting across countries and trying to understand how uh, the different furlough schemes short time work wage subsidies affect the dynamics and and they seem to play an important role, but you know we're still at the correlation stage. So I'm just wondering, have you got any further thoughts about that, or have you got any further along about it? So thank you, Rimi, for your yeah very interesting question. And as you said, it's very early stage to say anything about that. But we really uh, there's a first issue that the data in the UK around further scheme is not available at the firm level, so we will not have a measure of which firm has like how many jobs they put on furlough or not, and which exactly what firms in. So I think we can have information at the occupation and maybe the industry level from ONS, but that's more or less it. So we have them in mind and we know that these furlough schemes, I know for France, for example, the number of uh, firms going on liquidation is much more, much less this year. And we, we suspect that it's because the government intervention has more or less su supported firms that would have existed in any case uh, if these schemes were not in place. So we believe there's the similar, trend, uh, similar mechanisms have, happening here in the UK. But no, we don't have any like specific, uh, we know that we need to disentangle them and take them into account. And, but no, I not have a specific idea on how we're gonna do this exactly, but yeah. we are keeping for sure this in mind to take into account in our study. And yeah, yeah. I'll, if we can yeah, maybe write to, we can uh, speak. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, work on then. yeah, yeah, I'd be keen to email you afterwards. I will say in Ireland, they publish everyone who's on uh, wage subsidy schemes. So we don't have a furlough scheme, so to speak, but wage, every firm is on a big long list and it's published, which okay. is quite interesting because it's public money, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there may be something interesting to, to do there, but I'll talk to you on email, Elodie. Really okay. interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Brilliant, thanks. And then perhaps we can finish with a question for Belka from Claudia Playmower about your um, about Belka's skill un uh, universe. Claudia, did, do you want to yes. ask your question? 
Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, I've seen this um, skills universe before and right from the beginning I would have liked to see some movements in those suns and stars. Do you think you can use uh, this way of depicting uh, the demand and the relationship between uh, skills also for showing a change over time? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, uh, Claudia. I think it, technically it should be possible. Uh, I, 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 I think it will, it will uh, take some, some uh, development time to, to put that in because you, uh, you need to recalculate uh, the, the graph for multiple times and then try to, to make, the, make, the, make the dots move. But, but technically, I don't see a big, uh, I, I, I think uh, it should be possible, yeah. It's a good idea, actually, yeah. So, so what, what we already did was uh, apply um, uh, 3D uh, um, uh, 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 glasses, goggles in it. So you can already see it in 3D when you fly through it, and then it, it is already a little bit moving, but the movement is only, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's not representing anything, only your, your fly through the, through the space. Yeah, it would be, so, sorry, just one more thing. It would be great, for example, to, to analyze, to do this core current analysis uh, yeah. at an interval of, let's say, a quarter of a year or maybe half a year even yeah. might be enough. And then uh, visualize how the size and the color of those planets change and how they uh, move position. Yeah, we, we have data on multiple years. We have data going 15 years back. So. We could even do a, a much a, a bigger scale uh, uh, ex experiment. Thanks for the suggestion, Claudia. No, I think it's a great suggestion. And you might be able to spot even the emergence of new skills and new jobs as well. It would be great. OK, well, we should leave it there because we're out of time. But just to say thank you all so much for coming along and listening. And thank you so much for the panelists for some great sessions. Um, if you didn't get a chance to kind of ask your question, then please feel free to reach out to the panelists afterwards. Uh, I think that's all I had, other than to say the next session, I think, starts at 11.30. So uh, see you all then. Thanks very much.